History command words and question stems. Probably the most important thing you're going to have to do for any of these exams below, <clears throat> AP, AS, A-level, IGCSE, GCSE, IB, whatever it is going to be, is to understand the command words, understand the question stems, understand exactly how this prompt was crafted and how you need to respond to it. And again, this is applicable right across the board. There's only so many ways to formulate a history question for an exam. And uh, no matter what side of the Atlantic you're on, I think you'd find that the formulation of these questions and the questions themselves are remarkably similar. Types of history questions. Well, fundamentally, there is a lower level question, a lower mark question, knowledge and understanding. This is asking to recall and select relevant historical knowledge. Now, the extent to which you would have to do that would depend upon the weighting of the question and how much it's worth in that particular exam scheme. But for all intents and purposes, whatever facts you do deploy, they should be relevant, they should be major, they should be able to be analyzed to the extent that it's going to address a thesis that you're going to write that will not be a restatement of the prompt. Understanding historical context, that is being able to demonstrate that you know what particular time period, what particular, uh, the, you know, if you will, zeitgeist might have been going on at that, at, at that time as a basis of, of uh, comparison. And uh, so some questions, of course, are simply going to address your knowledge and understanding of the historical source itself or the historical source in relation to others. Application and interpretation. Now here it's not simply just the recalling and selection of information, it's applying that historical knowledge as evidence, making sure that you can use it to help support, to substantiate a thesis that you've developed <clears throat> based on the prompt. Synthesis and evaluation. Now, as I have presented them, they are in increasing sophistication and complexity. And synthesis and evaluation are definitely a higher order responses that they would be looking for. Therefore, just by knowing the type of question, you know, if you will, <clears throat> how much you need to write, to what extent you need to write. Here, when we evaluate, we are assessing. We aren't just criticizing. We are criticizing in a historical analytical manner. Here it is almost essential that you're able to name people, things they've written. Uh, could be a historian, best if it is historians, to try to show that you understand there are different approaches to and interpretations of historical issues and events. This is where, if it's a uh, source-based question, a DBQ, that you would use the historical source as evidence. You're going to not just analyze it, <clears throat> certainly not superficially, you're going to analyze it in terms of it being trustworthy, reliable, and useful to a historian. Summarizing all these points, ideally you want to come to a judgment. And one needs to think in terms of you are a historian answering a question, a question that may have vexed historians throughout time, and you're coming up to your own original determination. It might be based off what you've studied, it might certainly be based off what you've read, and it might be compared to other historians' viewpoints and interpretations. But you are challenged to arrive at a judgment. Use of historical skills. These are fundamentally implicit. You've been taking history for a number of years now. You are preparing for a pretty high stakes exam and whether you are cognizant of or conversant with specific historical skills you certainly need to make sure that you are writing as if you are a historian using those skills that are expected of a historian and reaching a historical judgment so what follows are a number of different uh, command words and you can stop and pause and look at these. I'm sure you've seen all of these to one extent or another. 
Usually examination boards aren't very creative in the command words that they use. There's an awful lot of repetition. And again, that idea is in, in, in your benefit, for your benefit. It allows you to anticipate because instructions for exams, because command words, uh, uh, the, the expectations, the tasks. You know, this is not something you have to figure out while you're sitting there writing your response. You need to know these well ahead of time. Uh, there's evaluate, there's explain, differentiate, enumerate, or list. Uh, that very rarely happens, but still it's, it's there for your delectation. All right, now to get into some of these in a little more detail. Describe. And when we look at a prompt, we deconstruct the prompt. And there's four ways by which we need to interpret the prompt and what the objectives are, implicit or otherwise. They're usually quite explicit, actually. But we need to be prepared to the extent that we can understand the implicit nature of the intent of the examiner through the prompt and what your obligation is to respond to it. I think three relevant facts. I think that's uh, pretty reasonable for any one of these lower order questions. If you look here at this example, describe the main features of the alliance system, which existed in Europe in 1914. Now this is 1914, it's the entire year. You can take that prior to or after. And the main features, probably, if I were to choose to respond to this question, not only would I announce, perhaps, that we have a central power alliance system, and we have what was the Triple Entente alliance system, but I would probably want to best explain it as uh, during, during the execution, perhaps after Russia is mobilized. While describe is relatively factual, you do need to give meaning to it. Explain requires you to talk a little bit more about causes and consequences. Still need to deploy information, still need to have evidence, facts, dates, people's names, etc. But you need to add a little value to it. What does it mean? What is the meaning of that particular event? For instance, down below. After the Bolsheviks seized power, there was a civil war. Explain the reasons why the weakness of the whites led to their failures in the civil war. Now, you are explaining the weaknesses. Well, if they are weaknesses, they are exploited. Who are they exploited by? By the Reds in Trotsky and the Red Army. So again, talked previously about explicit. This is pretty explicit, but there's also the implicit. So while the questions are formulated in a very opportunistic way, they are also expecting you to make that next jump. Your responsibility as a history student is to identify what they're really looking for. A little higher up on the uh, cognitive level, perhaps, would be something like why. Why is definitely within the realm of what historians are all about, and that is explaining causes, causation. Why would never be only one reason. Why would be a multi-causal approach, but identifying by way of thesis one particular reason, which is the most important. And that is your historical judgment. Your historical judgment is based upon the thesis you come up with. It cannot be wishy-washy. It must be directed toward an argument that you're going to identify by way of thesis, maintain by deploying evidence, and win that argument by synthesizing and concluding. Do you agree? A little misleading. Make sure you never use personal pronouns. I do agree. I think. I believe. I feel. That's not how you are meant to respond to this. And do you agree is a prompt indicating that you have looked at or understand evidence in such a way that it would shape a judgment that you're going to come up with. For instance, look down below. Five-year plans were a great success in the years 1928 to 1941. By the way, anytime there is any language that would be a sweeping generalization, a great success, obviously you're not going to agree fully with this interpretation. Or you may, if in fact you have credible evidence that would overwhelmingly prove your thesis. However, these are meant for you to compare and contrast, to weigh the value of evidence, and to make a judgment accordingly. 
And in some of the source-based questions in the DBQs, and this is, this is where the GCSE and the IGCSE have a distinct advantage because they break down the task of source analysis into a series of questions. And that kind of scaffolding and bridging is very important. So AP people pay attention to the potential of looking at um, the British exam boards and how they structure their source-based papers. It gives you a great opportunity to understand how you would formulate your paragraphs, how to cross-reference, etc. The captions are worth their weight in gold, and it is vital that looking at, in this case, source A, you were to read the caption. Now, we don't have the source here, and that's fundamentally irrelevant for what I'm trying to get across to you, but make sure you thoroughly invest yourself in the captions. Don't forget that the people who make up this exam work laboriously to ensure that they present to you every opportunity possible in helping you analyze these sources. So, here we're working with a singular source, seeing if you can understand that source and what it does suggest. Remember, this is never ever going to be superficial. Whatever you're initially thinking when you look at the source, you have to take that one or two steps deeper to make sure you're going to get any points at all or any marks at all in your answer. And again, a source-based <clears throat> do you agree is meant for you to also not answer this with personal pronouns. But as it says down below, source A suggests possible aims of German foreign policy before the First World War. So what they've told you, essentially, is what source A is about. Do you agree that these were the main aims of German, Germany's foreign policy before the war? Explain your answer using the source and your own knowledge. So while they will give you approximately three marks, or half, of what you need to analyze or respond to concerning a particular source, here, source A, the other half is going to be comprised of your own knowledge. So when you look at the caption, you need to consider, what else do you know? What do you know in comparison? This source fits into other sources that I know are about German foreign policy. I know this about German foreign policy. How does that measure to what's being enunciated in source A? And then respond accordingly. Now here, which was the greater reason? It really doesn't matter which one you choose. Either one, the Schlieffen Plan or the Naval Arms Race with Germany. Either one, clearly, since they put them there, either one would be, would be viable. But what you need to do is you need to make sure that you can explain its importance, its significance, in terms of it being more important than the other. So here you're looking at about a, a one to three ratio of working with the other one and then taking the opportunity to fully explain the importance of the one you choose. Now, useful, we're talking about usefulness to the historian. You are a historian. We talk about usefulness, then you walk your way back and you have to make sure you attest to reliability, trustworthiness, you have to detect bias, and here is where the caption, again, comes in incredibly handy. Now, we don't have source B here, it's irrelevant. How useful is source B for studying the Bolshevik seizure of power, October slash November 1917? Okay, again, it says, use source B and your own knowledge. Now, connecting between the two, the information contained in the caption and source B and your own knowledge are your source analysis skills. So talking about bias, trustworthiness, and usefulness in that order, that somewhat bridges the gap between a 5-5 split for this particular response. That's the connective tissue. That's the really where the examinations officer, the person who's going to be reading your response, that's where they are looking for your added value to the evidence, to the source, and something a little bit beyond what would be a simple response. Okay, explain why. 
A little bit higher order thinking required here. This is a causation question. All causation responses are multi-causal. That's why it says down below a range of reasons. Now, depending on the particular question, you might want to consider at least three different reasons, one being the most important, one being the basis of your thesis statement. Ideally, you have to make sure that in the conclusion, you reach a judgment, a strong judgment, a judgment that is reflective of your thesis statement. And again, remember, our introductions and our thesis statements are written last. And they are written last because you can't possibly introduce, initially, something you haven't written yet. Why would you take the gamble of writing a thesis statement when you haven't actually presented the paragraphs, the evidence, the analysis, etc.? This may be, perhaps, a little more difficult than any of the other ones we've looked at yet. How far does whatever source support or agree with? Now remember, these are specifically selected and chosen for you to come to a strong judgment, a determination. There is, in this particular scenario, a, a range, a parameter of an acceptable response. I'm not going to say you can't be wrong. Uh, you can certainly be off the mark, and that's, that's not what we want. We want something that's going to support, and support means commonality. Where do we find points of agreement in both sources? To what extent do we find points of agreement? You can make that numerical. Did I find one, two, or three? If I find three, then it certainly does support. Now, you can use your outside knowledge, and you can use whatever you're able to garnish from the caption, but the emphasis here is on you determining source C supporting the evidence in source B. explain the key features of either Blitzkrieg or Guerrilla Warfare. Blitzkrieg or Guerrilla Warfare. Okay, well this is a pretty specific question. It's asking you to explain the key features. And because this is worth seven marks, it is expected that you're going to make reference not just to the theory of Blitzkrieg or the theory of Guerrilla War, although that's good. You're going to have to talk about the, the uh, perhaps the weapons involved, you need to talk about specific incidences and perhaps the unfolding of maybe a battle or a campaign that would involve either Blitzkrieg or guerrilla warfare. You are addressing one or the other. Don't think that it would be beneficial for you to split your response between Blitzkrieg and guerrilla warfare. Okay, it does clearly say. And again, that this is part of understanding the questions. Understanding the command words is, is deconstructing that question with that understanding and specifically giving them what they want. Judge me. Time and time again, right across every examination board, again, IB, GCSE, AP, whatever it's going to be, you are expected to come to a judgment. Now, in the AP world, they call that synthesis, which is a bit mystical, but judgment, I think, is much clearer. Explain why you agree or disagree with this view. And here you have to be a little bit bold. You have to be the historian you're supposed to be. And you must come to a determination. And this is why we write our introduction and our thesis statement last. We do that because the thesis statement and the conclusion are going to be quite closely tied together. And that conclusion, when it does say synthesis, it is talking about the synthesis of your analysis, the value you added to the evidence that you used to support your thesis statement. And when you synthesize that, when you bring that all together in a cohesive element within the conclusion, then you are making a judgment. And that first sentence in the conclusion is a restatement of what your intended thesis statement is going to be. And that in and of itself is a judgment. So too isn't your thesis. However, when we get down to the conclusion, that judgment is embedded in a rich tapestry of analytical brilliance. And that kind of wins the day. You know, the first thing they're going to do is look at your thesis statement, then they're going to look at your paragraphs. Do you have dates? Do you have events? Do you have people's names? Do you have books underlined? And then what they're going to do is they're going to go down and re 
investigate your thesis by way of that first line in your conclusion. And then they really are looking for judgment. They're looking for synthesis. And that is going to be the difference between a B and an A. That's going to be the difference between a 4 and a 5. And here, how important was? Well, this is historical significance. Most of everything that you study to one degree or, or another, of course, is significant. Significance is not just the causes, not just the course of events, but it is the conclusion. It is the impact. How did this change things? Okay, so how far was, how important was, how successful was, how significant was? And while these are all essentially the same tasks, and they are predicated upon how you interpreted the impact of or the consequences of whatever the question is about, you aren't going to necessarily be wrong if you take perhaps an alternative view, but you do need to associate it with a connected consequence, with a connected impact. Now, categorically, you could approach this politically, militarily, economically, socially, um, artistically, intellectually. You, you can approach it categorically and discuss its impact and assess it accordingly, but you must have some sort of <clears throat> repercussion, and that needs to be outlined and detailed. All right, so these are incredibly important. This is knowing your adversary. This is really getting inside the head of the examination board and understanding where they are coming from. And the more work you do with this, the easier cognitively it will be for you when you're sitting the exam. Okay, I hope this was helpful. Uh, if you need any further help, contact me at strategicstudyskills at gmail.com.